Would you stand for the reading of the word of the Lord? Mm. In the book of Judges, chapter 6 and verse 12, Gideon is the personality here, the person that is being discussed and weighed, as it were, evaluated. In Judges chapter 6 and verse 12, Gideon was fearful. But an angel of the Lord, in verse 12, came and appeared unto him, Gideon, and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. If you look in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, it was in the year that King Uzziah died, according to verse 1. Here, Isaiah had seen visions of God, splendor and glory and power. And a fear struck him, obviously. Because in verse 5, he says, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto him, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Look at verse 8. And I, meaning Isaiah, heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. In the Hebrew language, it's pronounced heneni. It means, here am I. If you look in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and verse 1, the Gospel of John in the New Testament, in verse 1 it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14 it says, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I feel since there is such a marvelous delegation of potential in this congregation, among you in this part of the world, I feel it's vitally important that we discuss in this particular meeting, knowing who you personally really are. So I want to entitle this, Knowing Who You Are. Would you lift your hands, your voices, and your hearts for just a moment, and would you pray with me once again before you are seated? Let your voice out. Uh, petition Him. Seek Him. Call upon Him while He is near. And surely the presence of the Lord is near in this house here tonight. Lord Jesus, Almighty oh One, I'm asking you tonight, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jesus of Nazareth, hearken to our cry tonight. Let there be revelation and understanding sweep through our minds, our very souls, and our hearts. Let us be changed by the touch of the Master's hand, by the sound of your voice. By looking full into your wonderful face, I praise you for the great faith that is here. Bind us together now in one mind and one accord. Anoint us to hear and to speak. I give you praise, glory, honor, veneration. For thou art great and thou art greatly to be praised, Lord Jesus. I worship you. Grant these simple requests, I ask in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. Thank you for standing so long. You may be seated. Go ahead and clap and rejoice for just a moment with the wonderful presence of God that is in this house. I read the true story from something called the Bar Mitzvah Treasury of a child, a little boy about five or six years old, that became lost from his mother in a large department store. 
He was lost in between the racks of clothes. He could not find his mother. And he began to cry. And he began to run around. And he couldn't find her anywhere. Finally, he just kept running. And he came in front of the large doors that opened out onto the vast parking lot. He was standing there just weeping and sobbing. And one of the employees in that particular department saw him and came and tried to comfort the child, but the child would not be comforted. And finally, the employee of the store said to him, what is your problem? And the little boy said, I'm lost. I don't know, I don't want to know where my mother is. I'm lost. And so the woman said to him, what is your name? And the child stopped crying, and he spoke his name. And when he did, he became found because he knew who he was. And with that name, they were able to locate the mother, and they were reunited. It is vastly important that you know who you are. I remember being in a terrible car accident when I was 15 years of age. I stumbled out of the accident, and they were concerned with other things. They weren't paying attention to me, but I was knocked unconscious, but I was coming out of it, and I couldn't remember because at that time, my mother had just gotten out of the hospital with a surgery, and I had a small cousin that died what they call crib death, and when I was trying to come out get my memory and the facts sorted. I couldn't remember as I stumbled in that street. I couldn't remember if it was my mother that had died or my cousin had died. I couldn't get it straight. And all of a sudden, the details straightened and I realized what the facts were and I realized who I was and my world came together. The greatest quest of my life, the greatest goal of my life has been for a number of years. How does God see me? I want to know. I want to know how God sees me. I want to know how he looks upon me. Knowing who you are through God's eyes, as far as I'm concerned, is the greatest quest of life. It is the greatest goal in your life. What does God see me to be? What does God see you to be? What is God's image of me? What is God's image of you? I want to know. I have to know. I seek to know. I cry out to know. Gideon was a fearful man, a trembling man, until the angel of the Lord announced to him, you are a mighty man of valor. Once he heard the voice of God through that angel, he began to act like a mighty man of valor in spite of his circumstances and the conditions of his life. Abraham was just a Bedouin shepherd until God met with him and said to him, I will make of you a father of many nations. From that moment on, Abraham began to act like the father of many nations. Joseph, born among brethren who hated him, had a dream, and that dream caused him to rise above his environment. The hatred of his brethren, the conditions of where he lived, and he told that dream because it came from God and he believed it. And when he told it, he began to produce it because the telling of it produced it. It took him to Potiphar's house in the end result. There, there, he was lied upon and he was basically sold into slavery. But in Potiphar's house, he became, became second in command to Potiphar himself. But as I started to say, in Potiphar's house, Potiphar's wife lied against him. That put him into another prison. 
sold again, as it were, into slavery. But there, he became second man in control. And finally, he became second man in Egypt. He was second to Pharaoh himself. Because once you have heard the voice of God, it changes everything. It doesn't matter who says what. It doesn't matter what the conditions are. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. If you have heard the voice of God, God, it changes everything, and everything becomes under your subjection. When God speaks to a man the way God sees that man, you can begin to see that taking shape or working or forming in them. When I pastored, I had wonderful people, as you have here, and I would watch people, especially young people. And people are people, and people have their problems, etc. But I could always tell when one of those people had heard the voice of God and God had spoken to them in some altar service and God had shown them what he saw them to be and what he wanted them to be and what he viewed them to be, they began to change. Their actions were different. They didn't seem to run to the same excess of riot as others did. They prayed more. They had a contact with God. And some would say to them, well, you've suddenly become holier than all the rest of us. Well, maybe that's true and maybe it isn't, but it doesn't matter what people say. If you've got a hold of God and he is leading you, keep walking in that path. Keep walking in that path because as far as I'm concerned, you'll never get too much of Jesus. You'll never get too much of Jesus. I've had people say to me, oh, Stone King, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. That is not true. The more you know about God and his word, the more power you have to help people in this world. No one can help this world as powerfully as someone who knows, actually knows the power of the word of God and knows it. You are the most valuable person on the face of the earth. And I prophesy to you in the end time before Jesus comes, the most powerful people on the face of planet earth will be those prophets among us who rise up, who can stop the rain, who can stop everything. I tell you in the Old Testament, the kings feared the prophets because they controlled everything. We're coming to a point in all of this, and I can feel something among you here this time. There's something trying to escape from you. There's something trying to get out of some of you. And I know that life in itself tries to hold you back, but I am encouraging you here tonight to let yourself escape into the realm that God wants you to get into. Am I talking to anyone here tonight? Does anyone understand what I'm saying? I know you love this church. I know you love the Willoughby's. I know you love the pastors here and the staff. I know that. But there's something about you that wants to get beyond where you are. There's some of you that are just distressed. You've seen it. You've heard about it. You come to church and you get motivated. But motivation without direction is frustration. You've got to get some kind of direction. If God would use me, he will use you. God will use anybody, but the secret to being mightily used by God is availability. If you are available, God will use you. If you are available, God will use you. He is looking for someone. He's pulling, as I said last night. For example, I got the Holy Ghost in 1963. I was so excited to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost because I went to a church that taught if you just believe, you're saved. And that's all I knew. Well, when I came among you people, you had more than just belief. You had action. You had power. You had demonstration. There was a reality among you I had not felt in any church I'd ever been in. So, I was so excited when I got the Holy Ghost and baptized in Jesus' name because I could find it in the book. It wasn't some man-made doctrine. I could find it in this book. And if you can't prove it out of this book, forget it. Forsake it. Go another direction. It's what this book says that counts. It's not what some church father says or what some church historical individual personality says. It's what's in this book. If it's in this book, you can stand on it because it's a rock. It is a rock. So I was excited. I would work and come home from work, swallow my dinner whole, and lie on the floor and pray and speak with tongues for two or three hours. 
I was wild just like you, boy, just like you. I would just do, I would just worship God. I wept. It. In fact, I prayed so hard to get the Holy Ghost, even after I got it, I'd go back to the altar and worship just as long as I had used to pray for the Holy Ghost. Just worship God and speak with tongues and practice the Holy Ghost. I mean, why not? It's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. I mean, think about it, folks. God is alive inside of me. He's not out here. He's alive inside of me. He's alive inside of you. So I would practice the Holy Ghost. Well, you can't pray like that. You can't cry to God like that and God ignore you. When you worship him, he is drawn to you like a magnet. Mm. A Baptist boy came into a service where I was once. And he wasn't sure he liked the service. And so I walked back to him. He was standing on the aisle. And I said to him, at the altar service, I walked back. And I said to him, do you believe in Jesus? He said, yes. I said, um, do you love God? He said, yes. I said, do you know about the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking with tongues? He said, yes, and I don't want it. Well, my spirit can match yours. I said, well, will you just pray? That's exactly how I said it. He shook him. He said, yes. I said, come with me. <laughs> I took him by the hand. He led right down to the altar. I said, lift your hands. He just, obedient, just like that. He lifted his hands. I said, close your eyes, fast your attention upon God. He knitted his eyes and his eyebrow like that. I said, give the Lord your voice and worship him by saying hallelujah. He started saying hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Listen, friend. There is no way you can stand here with your hands raised like this, worshiping God, your mind and your attention upon him, worshiping him by saying hallelujah, and God ignore you. I knew what was about to happen. The Holy Ghost fell on him suddenly, and I ducked just in time because he was strong. He, his arms came down like that. It would have just probably knocked me out. His hands came down. He burst out speaking with tongues and spoke with tongues for 30 minutes. I was standing there when he stopped speaking with tongues. He opened his eyes, and his eyes were shining with the Spirit of God. I said, now do you believe it? He said, yeah, man, yeah. <laughs> he was just into it. <laughs> I said, come with me. There's another half. You need to be baptized in Jesus' name. He came out of the water, through water every direction, speaking with tongues, shut, and then stood there preaching to us how great this was. And I said, hey, we got other people waiting to get baptized. Get out of the water. We've been trying to tell you this for years. Get out. We dragged him out. <laughs> what I'm saying is, I was so excited to know about this truth. God, I wasn't, I wasn't even three months old in the Holy Ghost, but I prayed like that every night. I, I just couldn't get enough of Jesus. I'm still like that. One night, about 2 o'clock in the morning, I had a dream and I dreamed that I was in the middle of a football field preaching to thousands of people. And when I finished preaching and gave an altar call, people came streaming out of the grandstands toward me in the middle of that football field. I woke up in the middle of the night with my hands raised in the air, sobbing and speaking with tongues. I only had the Holy Ghost about three months. Just sat up in the middle of my bed, speaking with tongues and crying. I knew that I had heard the voice of God. That was his plan for my life. I would not always be working in the business world as I was then. There was coming a day when I would stand in the middle of a football field and God would call hundreds of people to come and get the Holy Ghost. I'd preach to thousands. But I didn't tell anyone about that dream because nobody would have really believed it anyway. It didn't come to them. It came to me. It was my own personal possession from God himself. And I went off to Bible school, and I kept working and doing things. I figured out today, it was about 10 years ago, I was invited to come to Fiji to preach a general conference there. And uh, I got there. I went. And when I got there, <clears throat> Brother Stacarver picked me up, and, um, and their son-in-law, whatever, and they, they said to me, they said, Brother Stone King, we, this is 34 years later after the dream, 34 years later. Brother Carver said, Brother Stone King, 
this meeting is so big, there's no building in the city big enough to house the meeting, so we're going to have to have it in a football field. I said, whatever, and I'm not thinking, I'm not remembering. That's our problem. <laughs> we don't think, we don't remember. And um, I said, whatever, and uh, it'll be fine. So it started raining the moment I arrived, and uh, it started pouring. I got to the hotel room, and I said, Brother Carver, how are we going to have a meeting outside in the middle of a football field with this rain and the mud? He said, I don't know. I said, well, we'll see what happens. And I began to cry and pray, oh, God, stop the rain, stop the storm. I was really injured. They dropped me off and left me. And that night again, I, I called him and I said, Brother Carver, I don't know how we're going to do this. He said, well, there's a big, big stadium. He said, a lot of people will just be in that stadium. There'll be four or five thousand people. He said, so I said, well, I work with the gift of faith, so I'll just stay in under the, under the roof of that uh, uh, Coliseum area and I stayed in, but I will just work with faith and that cordless mic, and I'll work among the people and preach right there in the, in, among the people in the audience. He said, fine. He said, tomorrow night they're having a singspiration. He sa I said, well, I don't know for sure if I'll go to that. I said, well, I will go. I want to see what's going on and what, what I'm involved with. So I went. Well, mud, pools of mud, every place, every place. And so here we are, and they had this singspiration. Well, the next night the meeting started. So I preached, and we had a move of God. I mean, but the public around that football field didn't like the music we were singing and the preaching that they had heard. So they registered 72 complaints with the city to shut us down. Brother Carver calls me. He said, Brother Stone King, they have registered complaints against us. He said, we're going to have to close this meeting down. I said, nonsense. You've already paid for this. How can they do that? He said, this is the third world country. They can do what they want to with you, and they do. They take your money and can throw you out. I said, I said God has got to do something for us. But what I didn't know was this. They had had a drought. There had been no rain in that nation for, for several months. The sugar cane was scorching, drying up and dying in the field. Cattle were dropping dead in the field. The water had begun to become rationed, and they were fearful of an epidemic breaking out because they'd had no rain. But they had put my picture all over that island on various places, and the news spread through the city that this American evangelist had brought the blessings of God with him, and the rain had returned. You can't know those grandstands were flooded with people, flooded with people. And I don't know, there was one service I did on a Sunday morning. I just taught on the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and when I opened it up, there were hundreds of people that came running out of those grandstands into the middle of that football field. And once, once... They stopped complaining, and the people came out of the news spread. The rain stopped, and the mud dried up, and we had a great time of it. But on Sunday morning, those people came running out of those grandstands. And as I watched them beginning to run, the dream came back to me. Thirty-four years later, I think there were over 500 that received the Holy Ghost that Sunday morning. A year or two later, I went to... El Salvador. I could only be there one night and a, and a Saturday morning. I taught on the Holy Ghost in the middle of a football field. And when I gave the altar call, those people came streaming out of the audience and standing there in about 20 or 25 minutes, 1,125 people received the Holy Ghost. Nobody touching them. It just fell like rain, and people walked out waving crutches. This was about 36 years after the dream. What I'm saying is this. If God has ever spoken to you, if you've ever seen yourself doing it, if, if he has ever shown you who you are, what you are as he sees you hold on to it it will come to pass it will 
come to pass. I'm talking to people in this area. I'm talking to people in this area. I'm talking to people in this area that have had visions of God and voice from the Lord showing you and telling you what he wants to do with you. If I'm talking to you, if I'm not talking to you, throw your hands in the air for just a moment and let your voice out and just worship God. Because out of this, out of this meeting, something has got to happen. Brother Timothy, something has got to happen here this year for many of you. I want a holy boldness to come upon you. I want a holy boldness to come upon you like never before. That you will stand up and say, yes, I am called. Yes, I am going to be used of God. Yes, his anointing is upon me. Yes, his voice is in my life. Let your voice out for just a moment. And just cry out to him in your way of worshiping him. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Take the hand of the person next to you. And hold that hand and begin to pray one for another. Something will pass from one to another. To visitors. To those who have not had a vision. Something will pass. The presence of God. The great faith of the Lord. That's it. There's a tremendous anointing upon this audience. There's a tremendous anointing. A powerful anointing. Upon this congregation. This body of believers. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I've never done this before, but if it could feel that good the first time, why would it feel like the second time? Do that again, and this time lift your hands. Before you just held on to each other's hands, but hold them and lift. There's something trying to come down upon us here tonight in this place. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Can you feel it? Can you feel it? There's an anointing. There is an anointing. And that anointing is falling for you personally. Upon you, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Minister to us, Lord Jesus. Speak to us here tonight. It's not the preaching. It's not oratorical capabilities and presentation that's so important here tonight. It's that you connect with these people, that these people connect with you, that their lives are changed forever, that change is upon them, that power is upon them, that blessing is upon them, that anointing is upon them now. I praise you for it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Oh. Look at your neighbor and say, I've got something. Say, something has happened for me. Once you've ever seen yourself as God sees you, you'll never ever be the same again. In the beginning, the Bible says, was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That word, Word, comes from the Greek word logos, which means thinking, plan, or pattern, or blueprint. And we hear a lot about that. But there's another aspect of God that is not just logos. It's called rima. Rima is the utterance voice of God. One is the thinking, the plan, the mind of God. But the other part of God is the utterance of his voice, the power of his spoken voice. Rima is the seed of all faith, the utterance of God. And no matter what anyone tells you, 
You don't ever really get it until you get Rima. You can desire to preach. You can desire to be used by God. But until you get Rima or the utterance voice of God for yourself directly from God, it never ever really happens or comes together for you. Every operation of God is by Rima. God speaking to our hearts. Have you ever heard someone stand and prophesy? Ever heard someone interpret a message in tongues? All they're really doing is repeating what they hear God speak inside of them. That's exactly what you are hearing. You're hearing the voice of God. And the one who interprets, the one who prophesies, is literally repeating what he hears from the Spirit of God speaking inside of him. Every operation of God is by Rima. It is the creative force of God. When you look at the stars at night, he spoke those into existence. When you watch the rising and the setting of sun, he spoke that into existence. He spoke everything into existence that exists. He said, let there be light. And light stood shining on one hand and darkness rolled up like a scroll on the other. He spoke to the mountains. He spoke to the valleys. He spoke to the forest. He spoke to the air. He spoke to the sea. Everything he created was by Rima. The utterance voice of God. David was a shepherd boy, just a shepherd boy. But Samuel the prophet was commissioned by God himself to seek a replacement for King Saul because Saul had strayed from God and his laws and his commandments. Samuel went to the household of Jesse, the father of David, Samuel requested that the sons appear before him. And every son that Jesse had walked by the prophet. And when the last one was gone by that was present, Samuel said, is there not another? And Jesse said, yes, David, the shepherd, is in the field. Samuel said, bring him. And so they went to get David. One of the brothers, maybe a couple of them, ran to the field, to the pasture, to find David. And in the absence of those seeking out David, because the thing that Samuel knew did not move in him when all those others had passed by, and while they were waiting for David to be brought, Jesse invited Samuel to be seated. These words are absolutely glorious to me because Samuel said, no, I will not sit down. What he was really saying is, I will not sit down until the king comes, is what he was saying. And there are a lot of voices upon you, especially you young people. There are a lot of voices in this world that want you to do this or to do that or do something else or take your leisure or take your rest. But there is something in me that says, I will not sit down until the king comes. I will not be seated. I will not stop until he comes in the clouds of glory, until the king appears. That's my goal. That's why I will never retire. I'm never going to retire. I just turned 67 two days ago. I'll never retire. As long as I've got strength, I will prop myself up if I have to hold on to something. And I will talk about Jesus. And I will tell his story. I told that to a, someone who heard me. A prophet of God heard me preach that just recently when I said I would never retire. He was watching on Comcast. He called me. He said, Brother Stone King, well, I was watching and our whole church was watching you. He said, God spoke to me and said, 
that man will never have to lean against anything to hold himself up because he loves me and he preaches my truth. I will extend his energy. I will extend his life. I will extend his spirit. I will extend his strength. And he will always stand because he preaches my word. I feel like dancing before all of you. I've got a promise from God. I've heard the voice of God. I've heard the voice of God. I've heard the voice of God. And may you hear the voice of God here tonight. If you can feel something speaking to you. If something is moving upon you. Will you clap your hands again? Would you stand to your feet? Whatever you would like to do. Would you just cry out to God? Hallelujah! The Holy Ghost is in this area. The Holy Ghost is moving through this area. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Brother Willoughby, I've got a feeling. Brother Willoughby, I've got a feeling that your strength is never going to diminish because you love him, because you've given what you have given. The hand of God is upon you and your work is only beginning. The greatest is ahead for you. Sister Willoughby, I believe with all of my heart that this Jesus has healed and touched you. Your work is not finished. This world needs you. Thus saith the Lord in the name of Jesus of Nazareth by the authority of the word of God, by the power of the name of Jesus, I set you free from all fear your strength to return now in the name of Jesus of Nazareth if you believe that would you clap your hands would you shout with all of your might (laughs) hallelujah hallelujah can you feel that? Can you feel it? Can you feel it? Can you feel it? Can you feel it? Those tears are liquid love for the Savior that you have preached about like no one else. Yes! Hallelujah! Oh, clap your hands. Shout again. Dance before the Lord. I'll never dance enough. I'll never shout enough. I'll never pray enough. I'll never praise enough. I'll never preach enough to thank Him. Oh, Jesus, 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 Jesus of Nazareth, the spirit of utterance is in this house. Oh, lift your hands. Seek his face, O master of the universe, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We have time for this. I hear the muffled sound of weeping. I hear human voices praising. I hear words I cannot understand as the Spirit of God is speaking. The Spirit knoweth how to pray. Let the Holy Ghost just speak through you. Let a wave of His presence, His Spirit, His very breath Breathe upon the tissues of your heart, lungs, vocal cords, your very speech. Something wonderful is happening. Something wonderful, wonderful, something miraculous that only God can do is happening for many, many of you in this audience right now. That's it. Be ministered to. Be lifted. See clearly. Hear Rima. Hear the voice of the living God. Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth. Oh. Hallelujah, Jesus. David, when he walked in before Samuel, 
the thing that Samuel knew leaped in his heart. Samuel opened that horn of oil. Imagine this shepherd boy. He bid David come before him. And David came. And Samuel didn't just anoint like we anoint. Like we anoint. He just poured that whole horn of oil over that boy's head and face. What was he doing? Greasing his head for a crown to slide upon. God's ways are not our ways. And as that oil dripped down his shoulders, his garment, the prophet said, I anoint you, David, king of Israel. A shepherd boy. But God saw him as a king, not a shepherd boy. From that moment on, David became associated with the king's son. They became best friends. He began leading men in the wilderness. Everything in his life wrapped around the utterance voice of God. It's like a grain of wheat in your hand, but it can become a thousand acre wheat field. It's like being programmed in a cell, like being wrapped up in a DNA code. Once God has spoken, everything changes. God said to Samuel, man looketh at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. And he sees self-image is a product of natural experiences or environment. It's the outward man. My self-image is how I see myself and how I think others see me. But God looks at my heart when sometimes even the man himself cannot see. That's why you need to hear the voice of God because God sees what you cannot see. Can you imagine, Timothy, that you would be where you are today? Where would you, could you imagine that you could be where you are today? Your relatives would never have believed this. Your parents would never have believed this. And when others scorned you or scorned me or scorned others here like us, yet God looked beyond and saw your heart and your potential. And here you are leading people like David in the wilderness, leading people. Amazing. I remember Wai Kiang when I first came here. I could hardly pronounce his name. <laughs> I remember. I remember him. And, and I, I remember just watching him. And I liked him. And all of a sudden, one night, the Holy Ghost came on him. And I felt God. And in common everyday street vernacular, I said, wow, I could feel God. I could feel an anointing come out of him as he exhorted the people. And I remember your father, the night he got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I don't think he can understand me. I am so proud of you. You tell him later for me. I am so proud of you. I remember when he got the Holy Ghost. That was a turning point in your life, Wake Young, because it erased everything. It erased everything. You saw, you heard the voice of God, which basically said by action, with what he did there, he, God was saying by action, I can do anything. I can do anything. Circumstances don't matter. The past doesn't matter. Details do not matter because I am God. Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. I worship you in Jesus' name. Let your voice out again. There's a rumble of anointing all over this place. There's just a rumble of anointing. Oh, 
Brother and Sister Doji, what wonderful people you are. Oh, you are anointed, my boy. And it came from God. I had nothing to do with it. But I know what it is when I feel it. There are glorious things ahead of you. You can't even imagine what is lying down the road that you're walking on. <clears throat> but it looms taller and taller every day of your life. And the doors have opened and you're beginning to see into areas you've never seen into before. Is it not unusual that somehow or other, I don't even know how you got to Singapore, but here you are, and I'm quite sure that most people who know you probably had no hope for you, but here you are. Look what you're doing. Look what God has done for the both of you. Only God could do that. Now you're going back to the Philippines and doing things that others wish they could do. If you answer the voice of God that comes to you, you will do things that other people only read about in books. Mm. Jesus! 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 I worship you. I know that you'll understand the spirit in which I'm doing this, but turn to your neighbor and say, I am really something. Normally we would call that pride, but here tonight it's acknowledging that God is in us, that God is upon us, that God works through us, that we are different from everybody else. I'm not just an individual in this world. I am a son of God. You are sons of God. You are daughters of God. Walking in this world. Carrying a light. An ambassador if you please. For this man called Jesus. I feel the greatest hindrance to revival in, in the world is feelings of inferiority within the hearts and lives of people. Many people have heard the voice of God. But we have a hard time believing sometimes that God really loves us. That he will do it for us. I think we all hear Rima at one time or another. But we don't trust Rima because we really don't trust ourselves. But here is the greatest understanding that I will ever give you. Please do not ever make this mistake. Please don't make this mistake. Please don't make this mistake. We make the mistake of feeling that Jesus will treat us the way we treat him. Because we have failed along the path because we haven't loved as we should have because we haven't kept the dedication intact. We walk away and we feel that because we have failed him, he will fail us. He will not do for us. But God does not ever treat us the way we treat him. That's why we're all still here. It's called grace. It's called mercy. And I'll never thank him enough. And you'll never thank him enough for the grace and the mercy that has been extended to you. That's why we got to clap and worship God and shout his praises and love him and lift him with everything that's in us. So just do it for a moment. Just do it for a moment. Thank you, Jesus, for looking beyond our faults and seeing a great need of you. We sometimes do not trust ourselves because we view ourselves as failures. And we hold this in our subconsciousness. And it's really what's in our subconsciousness that we communicate to others without even knowing sometimes we communicate it. For example, I get weary with the travel and everything. And uh, sometimes I'm praying in altars for people to get the Holy Ghost, and, and uh, they're not getting it. 
And if you ever see me or watch me in an altar service praying for people and I just suddenly stop and take my hands off from them and raise my hands like this and begin to worship God, I'll tell you exactly what I'm doing. I realize I'm not transmitting faith to them. So I reconnect with God until I get that faith and then I go back and pray again. I can tell when I'm transmitting faith and I can tell when I'm not. <clears throat> it's not what you shout in the ear or say in the ear that helps them get the Holy Ghost. It's what you transmit from your soul, the faith that's in you for them, the belief that's in you. That's what they receive. That's what they hear. Mm. Peter, Jesus called him a rock. He knew that Peter was going to fail him, cut off the high priest's servant's ear. Jesus looked at all of Peter's future and called him a rock. Abraham laughed at the promises of God. As I've told you before, that's why when the son was born, he was called Isaac, or Isaac, as we say, which means laughter. Moses failed God, you might say terribly, actually. And for his failing, he didn't get to cross over into the promised land with the Hebrew children. But let me show you the mercy of God. God does not treat us the way we treat him. Moses did get to the promised land on the Mount of Transfiguration. God does not treat us the way we treat him. His promises are sure. His promises are sure. What he hath spoken to you will come to pass. He will give you the desires of your heart. <clears throat> David became a vile sinner. Peter cursed and swore and denied Jesus. Paul murdered Christians. But the thing that encourages me and helps me to ever feel like I'm a good candidate is God never had anyone perfect to work with. So I qualify. I qualify. There's hope for me. But he can take us, and with his power, he can flow through us and confound the wise and cause the glory of God to be expounded in this world. God told Paul what he was going to make of him. He gave him Rima. The triggering experience for every man of God in the Bible who did something notable for God was God communicating his rima or his utterance voice to that man. Isaac, Isaiah rather, was a man of unclean lips, but the fire of God touched his lips. Jeremiah, God said, I have put words in your mouth. Only when God was able to show the man how he saw him was the man able to receive what God was giving or going to use him to do. How many parents are there here tonight? A number of parents. You do for your children not because of what they are, but because of who they are. God doesn't do for us because of what we are, which is less than desirable sometimes. He does for us because of who we are. I am his son. I've got his name. I don't obey to be saved. I don't. I obey because I am saved. People have that in reverse. They fight. I obey because I am saved. This is so much better than where I was. Is this better than where you were? That's why you're still here. And I'm never going back. There's nothing the devil can do. He can never get me back. He can never get you back. He can never get any of us back. We have been set free. We have been set free. God has taken a group of people. They were ex-slaves to the devil and is making a church out of it for himself. You talk about a nervous breakdown for Lucifer. It is a nervous breakdown. Every time you worship God and shout, he can't handle it because he remembers when. He remembers when. But you got free. You got away. You got delivered. I am free. I have been set free. I have been delivered. And we're never going back. 
Shout, I'm never going back. The Spirit of God overshadowed Mary to mix flesh with God. When the Holy Ghost came, it came to mix God with flesh. That's who I am now, you know. I'm flesh mixed with God. I'm God mixed with flesh. That's scary if you think about it. It means I have power. These signs shall follow them that believe. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, say Jesus, they shall cast out devils. I have that power. They shall speak with their tongues. I do it every day. They shall take up serpents. I don't do that. <laughs> that means accidentally. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. In a church upstate New York one time in the hot summer, no air conditioning, I was preaching a revival for them. It was a wooden pulpit. And in the middle of my preaching, I <clears throat> just reached in for the glass. The glass was opaque. I reached in and took the glass out and just turned it up and drank about half of it. And as it was going down, I was in a hurry preaching, you know how we do. I realized the water was not fresh as I had assumed. It was filled with slime. I drank a, I drank a half a glass of slime. But in my mind, I said, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. I never missed a word. I never was nauseous. I was never sick. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. What an insurance policy I am covered with. What an insurance policy I am covered with. Wonderful. 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 I heard the voice of God when I was just 23 years old, about preaching to thousands. When I got out of Bible school, I was in a meeting in Ohio. It was a big Sunday school conference convention, and uh, it was packed. I mean, they were standing. There, was, there wasn't any room in the aisles. They were packed everywhere. And I preached in the Holy Ghost. I preached on faith and miracles, and uh, I've always preached this way. I always have. I believe it. It's in the book. And uh, at the end of the service, what altar space was there was just flooded with people. Well, with that kind of faith, they brought a man from the back, the worst case in the whole place. The arm was locked in to his side. He couldn't even get a pencil between his arm and his rib cage. They brought him up for me to pray for him in front of everybody after what I'd preached. In other words, you preached it, now demonstrate it. <laughs> and I thought, God, <laughs> I'm just beginning my ministry, you know. And I thought, I've got to start somewhere, so this is it. I laid my hand on him and prayed in Jesus' name, and he fell out flat on the floor. Whew, it got me off the spotlight. I climbed over him and went to some other things. <laughs> Took the pressure off. Everybody was worshiping. What was so glorious, though, was at the end of the service, we had a lot of wonderful things happen. That man walked up to me in front of everybody, and he said, Brother Stone King, his eyes were filled with tears. He said, look, God had healed him. I was on my way, and I'm still on my way tonight because I have heard Rima. I have heard the voice of God. I have heard it. And it's mine. And I close with this. I have mentioned him before. T.W. Barnes, a prophet of God. He died about a year and a half ago now. 93, 90, 92 years old. He was like a dad to me. We'd been friends for 43 years. I met him within two weeks after I got the Holy Ghost. He always mentored me and helped me. I talked to him about everything, anything. He was a wonderful, wonderful individual. He has many, many stories. He'd seen mighty miracles of healing, been used mightily by God, and he was a genuine prophet of the Lord. But he told me the most incredible story, and I felt today, as I was studying and praying toward this service and you lovely, wonderful people, 
I felt like the Lord wanted me to tell you this. Brother Barnes told the wonderful story of how a number of years ago, many years ago, uh, he lived in Louisiana, Minden, Louisiana, but in Shreveport, Louisiana, Billy Graham came to that area with a crusade, a Billy Graham crusade. And Brother Barnes talked to many dignitaries, many Jewish rabbis, many important people. They flew in there to talk with him for 30 minutes and fly out. That's how valuable they considered him to be. When he preached at the campground, his message was aired free on the entire radio station throughout the entire state. I spoke at his funeral at his request. His funeral was aired live over the entire radio network in the city where he was buried. And school children the next day in school were talking about how they felt something when they listened to Brother Barnes' funeral. That's the impact one life made in that particular area and to the world. So <clears throat> he was very valuable to many people. But <clears throat> this Billy Graham crusade was coming to Shreveport. And the Lord spoke to Brother Barnes and said, take your wife and go to Billy's crusade. I want you to be there. And there will be two empty seats for you right on the front row in the middle. So you'll have seats, good seats. So Brother Barnes went to Sister Barnes. He said, Lucille, we're going to get ready. He said, we're going to hear Billy tomorrow night. The Lord has spoken to me and told us we're going to have two seats right on the front row in the middle, so everything's taken care of. So the next night, they got dressed, ready, got in the car. They drove to Shreveport. When they got to the auditorium where the Billy Graham crusade was conducted, the place was packed. They walked in. There were no seats anywhere. And they looked and looked and looked and looked. And finally, an usher said, they found a couple of seats about halfway down on the aisle. And so the usher said, well, this is all that's here. You'll have to be seated here. So Brother Barnes said, we sat down on those two aisle seats about halfway back in this vast auditorium. And when they got set down, Sister Barnes looked at Brother Barnes and she said, Tom, I thought you said Jesus told you we were going to have the front two seats right in the middle down front. Brother Barnes looked at her and said, that's what he said. <laughs> and that was it. After about 10 minutes or so, there was an usher down front. Didn't know them. They did not know him. He began to pace back and forth across the front. And he was looking. And all of a sudden, he came to the aisle they were seated on way back. And he began to walk down that aisle. And he would look from the left to the right, all the way down as he walked by that aisle. And every seat was filled. When he got to Brother Barnes, he stopped and looked at him. He said, would you folks like to have seats closer to the front? And Brother Barnes said, yes, that would be nice. The usher said, I can help you. Please come with me. And Brother Sister Barnes stood, and that usher walked them down that aisle all the way across the front. And right in the middle were two empty seats. And he said, you may be seated here. And they sat down. And Brother Barnes closed his eyes. He said, Jesus, why did you do it this way? <laughs> and the Lord spoke to him. He said, Tom, so you understand, I always know where you are. And that's what God is saying to some people here tonight. He always knows where you are. It may not look what you thought it was going to be like, but he knows exactly where you are. And he will lead you to that destination, to those two seats on the front row, so to speak. Lift your hands and let your voice out. Hear the voice of the Lord. Hear the voice of the Lord. He knows where you are tonight. He knows where you are tonight. 
He knows where you are tonight. He knows where you are tonight. If you have that assurance, would you stand and lift your hands and lift your voice out to him and just worship him as you hear the voice of the Lord. <laughs> let your voice out oh let your voice out toko toko shoto oh toko toko shoto oh toko toko shoto There is a precious spirit. There is a precious spirit of thanksgiving sweeping over this entire congregation. Let your thankfulness out. As you have heard the voice of Rima, the utterance of God, His touch, I invite you to come and lift your hands and now let your voice out to Him. He has spoken to you, but speak to him. Speak to him with the voice of thanksgiving. To be so unusual tonight, don't ask for anything. Just speak with the voice of thanksgiving. <laughs> That's it. Let your voice out. Let your voice be heard from on high tonight. Ascending to the throne room of God. Jesus, I thank you. Jesus, I worship you. Jesus, I thank you that you know where I am, that you know where we are. God, I thank you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Keep on coming. Just press your way in. Just press your way in. Keep on coming. Just press your way in tonight. Precious and wonderful things are happening. 
for you, for you. Otokoro jalatotha rakajata. Udalaro kate shalavara hakajata. Utakalatara vrakota ravrakota kajata. Utakalatara kate shalavara kataka. Alleluia, alleluia. Oh, lift your hands and just be thankful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. This is the real Jesus that is in this place tonight.